Okay, um, let's get down to business. This is Kurt Opsahl, the general counsel of the EFF, on here, the left. Thank you. There is William Buddington, technologist, waving his hand. And uh, the topic is, you all know, but let's say it again just for principle's sake, protecting your privacy at the border. So let's have a hand for the FF and Kurt Upsall and William Buddington. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming out here this evening. Uh, we are here to talk about protecting your privacy at the border. Um, as he mentioned, we're with the Electronic Frontier Foundation, we're an organization uh, dedicated to defending your, your rights online. And one of the rights we're concerned about is privacy. And one of the places where your privacy uh, can be very impacted is when you travel across uh, a border, especially uh, with your digital devices. So I think many people probably uh, understand this already, but uh, I want to start out with a uh, discussion. Why is it important? Why do we care about security and uh, privacy in your digital devices? Well, they are a window into your soul. What you can see in a digital device is every aspect of your life, the correspondence you have, the websites you've been searching, the financial records, your medical records. These are the sorts of things that if you give over control of your device, someone can look into, and uh, they often will have credentials, so someone could look into other aspects of your life that are uh, in the cloud and other servers. So it has a lot of very sensitive information. Uh, in addition to the, the information that uh, you may feel uh, is very private and sensitive for yourself, there's also some information which for a very long time in democratic societies has been recognized as not just sensitive, not just private information, but things that are outside of the scope of what would be properly uh, obtained by the government, things like communications with your attorney, communications between you and your doctor, uh, if you're a reporter or a source, communications between those two. Uh, and these are fundamental principles that still have a lot of value at the border, that we don't want to sacrifice these human rights and these values uh, just because you're exercising your rights of travel and going across a border. Uh, so, for purposes of the discussion, what is a border? Uh, so, uh, there are many ways of thinking about a border, and we're not just talking about sort of political borders. Like when you go from here over to the Netherlands, you probably are not going to pass through a custom search point, uh, and you're not going to be uh, implicated with some of the issues that we're raising here today. Um, so, it's not just the political borders, but it's the points of entry uh, into uh, into a zone, uh, like the Sengen zone. Uh, and oftentimes, these things are actually not exactly on the border. For example, an air Airport uh, can be you know, hundreds of miles from the physical border, but is treated as a border because that's a port of entry. Uh, and also, in some cases, uh, the border is actually at the departure airport, uh, so that the border can be set up so you go through that before transferring onto the plane and into the destination countries. So this is what we're talking about in terms of borders. And at these points, the government asserts more power and authority to conduct searches than they do throughout the rest of the country. However, uh, these these, these uh, governmental authorities are not beyond the power of human rights law and policy. Uh, some of these rights uh, I, I've quoted here coming from the UN Declaration of Human Rights uh, and from the European uh, Convention on Human Rights. That respecting your, your uh, uh, privacy, your autonomy, your correspondence, these are things that are widely recognized as, as fundamental rights. So here in the European Union, uh, they have sort of a, a two-standard system uh, for EU citizens and others who have a, a right of travel within the European Union. Uh, you go through a minimum check. Uh, and then if you're uh, uh, coming from a non-EU country, you're subject to a thorough check. 
uh, and this is usually done in uh, up to up to four stages. Uh, there will be pre-border checks. So if you uh, are traveling on an airline, the airline will pass through some some information about the passengers. Uh, in some cases, that information may also uh, uh, lead to a gate check or uh, an air uh, a check on the airline itself. Uh, and then when you get to your destination, there'll be a first line check, and you probably have all gone through this, where you show your password, have usually a short conversation with the uh, border agent, uh, and then if all goes well, uh, you go on your, your way. Uh, but uh, sometimes it goes to a second line check, a more thorough check, uh, where they're going to do a little bit further uh, investigation. Uh, some of the triggers that lead to this second line check, uh, if there's some issues in that, that short conversation that you've had, if the, they don't like the, the, the way that things were answered, that some communication difficulties, uh, if there are any irregularities in your documentation, if, you know, if your visa uh, doesn't have the right date, or there maybe there's a different spelling of the name on the visa as the passport, uh, and perhaps most importantly, uh, they will do a database check. They'll put your information into the database and see if it comes back with any signals, uh, or if there's any mismatch with the computer's information with the documentation you have with you. And these may lead to uh, a second line check. Um, and then in that second line check is where you might undergo the more thorough search. So we have the chart up here showing uh, the percentage of people who once they got to the second line, had a more thorough search. Now, this is not just device searches. This is any kind of the more thorough search. As you can see, there's actually quite a bit of a difference in Charles de Gaulle. This was in 2012. 48% uh, of those who went to the second line got the additional searching, while at uh, Frankfurt, uh, the low number, uh, only 7% got the more thorough uh, uh, searching. Uh, and also just give a sense of how that might go. Uh, we have a chart showing also from 2012 uh, how long it might be. So less than five minutes up to uh, one to two hours. And you can see the various percentage there for, for the airports. Uh, a lot of it being centered in the five to 15 minute range. But if they find something interesting you know, and if they want to go through a device search, you're probably looking more at the one to two hour range. Now, once you're at a particular airport, it is national law that is going to define the rules for what kind of search is permitted, whether they're allowed to uh, demand your password. Uh, but there are some fundamental principles. Uh, the U EU Agency for Fundamental Right has put forth the, the reasons that would justify uh, these additional searches uh, at the border point. One is to verify your identity, uh, where you're coming from, what your nationality is seeing if you're a proper person to be admitted. And the second reason would be to search for dangerous objects like drugs or weapons or to see if there's any evidence of criminal activity. And it's that last one that is the most likely one going to be the basis for a search of a device to look for some sort of evidence to bolster a uh, criminal activity or uh, in some cases terrorism. Uh, and which brings us to our, an example from the European Union, uh, the United Kingdom, well, they're in the European Union for, for the time being, uh, where they have Schedule 7 of the Terrorism Act. And this is a very broad power that has been granted to uh, uh, the authorities in the United Kingdom. Uh, it is limited by having a nexus to terrorism. And it was also uh, the uh, UK Court of Appeal found uh, some limitations under the European Charter uh, Convention for Human Rights. Uh, this came out of the case involving David Miranda, who was uh, uh, traveling between meeting Edward Snowden in Moscow and uh, Glenn Greenwald in Brazil, uh, was uh, detained under Section 7 at the Heathrow Airport, uh, and brought a challenge to that. Uh, the court ultimately did find that the uh, detention and the interrogation were okay, but said that the Section 7 uh, did not have sufficient protections for the right of free expression uh, because it didn't have uh, uh, the appropriate exceptions that would allow for journalists to communicate for sources. So this shows that uh, while it is a powerful act, it can be tempered by the uh, Convention on Human Rights. However, subsequently, uh, the, the border uh, uh, police in the UK have been asserting the right to demand power passwords. Uh, and uh, more recently, about a year ago, a man by the name of Mohamed Rabini uh, 
uh, was uh, uh, asked to provide his password. He refused to provide and was arrested for that. And uh, earlier this year, at September, that conviction was upheld. He plans to appeal, but this will be a very important case in sort of determining whether in the United Kingdom they truly do have the power to uh, invoke this law and for no other reason than, than suspecting. They want to see if there's any terrorism connections, uh, be able to demand a password and look through all of your devices. So, turning our sights a little more broadly around the world, a couple of countries to, to highlight here. First, in the, in the Commonwealth, uh, Canada and Australia are both countries that do claim uh, a right to uh, uh, demand your passwords and go through your devices and laptops at the border. Uh, the courts have not yet ruled on whether this is authorized under that, those countries' laws. Uh, so uh, at some point, there may be a challenge uh, to test this case. But in, in the interim, uh, that's something that you might face when pa passing over these borders. Uh, one thing of, of note is the Canadian uh, border police. Uh, they have a policy to restrict this to information that is on the device and not on the cloud. Uh, now, if somebody violates a policy, usually you don't have much of a remedy about it, but it is sort of nice to know that they do have that, uh, that policy. Um, and then uh, turning our sights a little bit more further afield to authoritarian regimes. Uh, and in this case, is that, uh, if they want to search your device uh, at a border, they probably can do so with relative impunity. Uh, so if you will be traveling to you know, Russia, China, uh, some of the more authoritarian countries in the Middle East, uh, in Turkey, uh, this will be a time to take some of the more maximum uh, precautions if you think they have have any uh, reason to uh, go through your devices, and we'll uh, discuss a little bit how we might figure that out later. Uh, because these countries may not be beholden to these international human rights norms, and there might not be very much uh, that you can do to stop it. Uh, one of the reasons I wanted to highlight Turkey in here uh, is that uh, they have uh, detained uh, up to 75,000 people for having an encrypted messaging app on their phones, simply for having the app, not because they were accused of doing anything particular with the app. Uh, this was Bylock was the, the name of this messaging app. Uh, and so if you were to travel over that border and they looked through your phone and found Bylock, that alone could be a reason for uh, further uh, detention. Uh, so, uh, and if you found it and it was, uh, if we were able to discover it was recently deleted, that also might be considered suspicious. And now let's turn to the, uh, the United States. Uh, in the United States uh, these days, the, uh, when you come there, the customs agents might ask you some questions, like ask you to unlock your device, uh, to provide a device password, to disclose your social media handles so they can do public uh, uh, searches about them. Uh, and how you can react to this depends a little bit on, on who you are. Uh, if you are a US citizen, then they cannot refuse entry into the country. Uh, so while well, they may seize the device, but ultimately you would be able to travel on to your destination. For a permanent rest, uh, resident, also uh, would be able to come into the country, but there would be a little bit of after effects because this would raise questions about whether you'd be able to keep that status as a permanent resident. And for everybody else here, perhaps the majority of the room, if you are not one of these two categories, uh, you'll be asked these questions in a situation where if you say no, they can deny entry until you have to turn around and go back to where you came from, which puts a tremendous amount of pressure uh, to provide that access and to give up a little bit of your privacy rights. Uh, so how often is this happening? Well, at an increasing rate. Uh, over the last uh, three years, uh, they have gone from uh, under 5,000 electronic media searches to on a pace uh, this year for over 30,000, uh, so a substantial increase. The one thing to keep in mind is this is out of 400 million uh, border crossings, so like at a purely statistical level, the odds are pretty low that a random person will have their uh, device searched, but of course, this is not actually random. So whether you, you know, your particular odds will, will vary. 
In addition, the U.S. has uh, started to undertake a program called Extreme Vetting. Uh, for the last several years, they have been uh, collecting social media handles, alias, and search results, and then providing that to uh, the Customs and Border Patrol to ask questions about what they find. And uh, uh, Donald uh, Trump has asked the DHS to expand this program uh, just about a month ago. Uh, and this will expand to looking at things like uh, your responses in public hearings, uh, speeches you may have given at conferences, uh, academic uh, websites where you may have published a paper, uh, and this stuff is considered sort of fair game to uh, be questioned about as you cross the border. Uh, and at one time, this was focused on people who were coming in with immigrant visas, ones who were planning to stay for uh, a period of time, uh, but they have expanded that to uh, more brief uh, travelers. So how does this work within the uh, constitutional and legal framework? Well, constitutional provisions do apply at the U.S. border, uh, but there is this, what's known as the border search exception, because the exception that proves the rule. Uh, routine searches do not require a warrant or individualized suspicion, but non-routine searches do need an additional level of suspicion. So what is a non-routine search? Well, it's defined as something which is highly intrusive, that impacts your dignity and privacy interest, or is conducted in a particularly offensive manner. So how does that break down with device searches, electronic searches? Well, uh, a couple of years ago, in 2013, a court of appeal found that a forensic search did require this additional level of legal process. And this is a forensic search, is when they take your device, hook it up to a machine, uh, copy the data on it, do some analytics. Uh, but a manual search, you know, where they pick it up, flip through it, uh, just with the border agent right there, that did not. So that was the dividing line in 2013. But then in 2014, there's a Supreme Court case, Riley versus California, where the court was looking at searches of phones. The government there was arguing that warrants were not necessary to search the phones, uh, and the court ruled otherwise. They said that, uh, that they, were, they recognized that there was a lot of sensitive data on the phone and that it was an intrusive search that required a warrant. Uh, and we believe that uh, that precedent should be applied to border searches. Uh, we filed a case earlier this year, Al-Assad versus Duke, along with the ACLU, to challenge the warrantless uh, searches at the border. The Trump administration has filed a motion to dismiss our case, which we are now litigating. So hopefully we'll be able to use that case and establish a precedent that you do need to have additional process to go through your devices at the border. Thank you. Um, one thing where there has been some, some limited progress uh, is access to the cloud. So in the Riley case, the court recognized, they used a great metaphor, they said the government's argument would be saying that it's like finding a key in a suspect's pocket and then arguing it allowed law enforcement to unlock and search your house. And that's actually a pretty good metaphor for what's on your phone because you have a lot of credentials, saved passwords, uh, which are essentially keys that allow the phone or your, your computer to unlock information information that you have stored elsewhere on the cloud. And it shouldn't be because you're carrying it in your pocket that this opens up your entire life to, uh, to the investigatory agent. And the Customs and Border Patrol has uh, said as a policy is only going to look at information that is physically resident on the device. Uh, keeping in mind that they'll, they'll still do public searches for information about your social media handles. Again. Like with the Canadians, this is a policy, uh, and so it's very important to be established as the law, but as a starting point, at least it's good they have the policy. Another important thing to understand about uh, uh, U.S. law, and I think this could be applied uh, elsewhere as well, uh, is the difference between passwords and fingerprints. So many devices these days are using fingerprints as a method of unlocking. It's very convenient, uh, and it does allow you to uh, uh, not have to type in your password every time. It's very convenient. But the law distinguishes between passwords because there's a lot of laws in the United States and actually in many other countries that provide you with a right to remain silent and not answer questions from the law enforcement. They have to do their investigations, but you can't be forced to answer. And those laws are a basis for arguments. You don't have to provide your password. But some cases have found that there are less protections for the information that's on your finger. 
in addition, besides the different legal protections, there's some practical ones. If you're at the border, your device can be unlocked with a finger. Uh, the border agent could grab your finger and just shove it down on the phone, and then it's unlocked, and you'll be arguing later about whether they should have had access and whether, instead of whether they can have access. And finally, it's if they're really interested, the government may have access to your fingerprints from other sources, and they may be able to try and get into the phone using that information. So, as you're approaching the border, it's going to think, how should I approach this? How should it work for me? And it's going to depend a lot on who you are and how you, uh, how you want to react to the situation. So things about who you are, your citizenship, your residence, your immigration status uh, will, will affect your thinking and, and what your chances are of getting searched and how you should react to it. Uh, you're more likely to be subject to the search depending on your travel history, if you've been to countries that are associated with terrorism, for example. Uh, your history with law enforcement, if you have an arrest record, if you have convictions, these will increase the, the likelihood of being subjected to a search. And then, when you're trying to decide how you would deal with a search, you're going to have to weigh some factors about your tolerance for hassle and delay versus your desire to make a statement and stand up for your rights. And these can be very tough personal choices. If you make the decision to push back on a search, you may suffer some, some consequences that you're going to have to, uh, have to deal with. The second way that you should be looking at it when you're, when you're deciding how to react to the border and what to do is think about the information that you're carrying with you. Uh, how sensitive is that data? What is the risk that uh, you would face if the data was seized? Both the risk that if, they, uh, if the uh, government got access to that data and also your risk of having loss of access to that area. If you didn't have a backup, for example, and you didn't get your device back. Uh, do you need the information when you get to the far side of the border? Uh, or if you have the information and you can put it on the cloud, will you be able to get that information through the networks that will be available on the far side of the uh, border? The quality, both in terms of how fast they are or whether, like uh, in some cases, there is heavy government uh, surveillance on those networks. So before you arrive at the border, you got to think through some of these issues. You might want to talk with your employer uh, about your work devices. They may have policies about whether you should be taking it over a border, may ask for some information to be deleted, uh, may say you should or shouldn't provide uh, passwords if asked. Uh, anything about protecting what you carry about there? We're going to talk a little bit more of this when we get to Bill's section, talking about technical protections, but things like backups, encryption, strong passwords. Then think about your online presence uh, for, for your devices, log out, remove credentials so that if they don't have a policy about uh, looking in the cloud, they would have to at least require or ask for passwords before they can do it, so it's tamper evident in that way. Uh, also, uh, put yourself in private browsing mode so if they're looking through your web history, they won't be there. Uh, you also may consider uh, uh, looking at your publicly available information and shifting it to uh, private, uh, making it friends only on Facebook or uh, going to a private account on Twitter. And most importantly, don't bring it. If they don't have it, they can't take it at the border. Uh, so consider leaving your devices at home if you're not going to need them. Maybe you can, if you need a computer but you don't need your home computer, consider bringing a temporary device like a Chromebook or a burner phone. If you don't need the data that's on your device, delete it. If you do need the data, consider moving it to the cloud and then picking it up when you get to the far side. Then, as you come to the border, it's important to first to plan ahead. Have an idea of what you want to do there, how you would react to various scenarios, so you're not making a decision when under this very uh, tough situation where you're under a lot of pressure of making a decision on the fly. But have a good idea what you want to do. Uh, when you're having the interactions, be polite and respectful. Uh, escalating the situation can lead to, to further problems that aren't necessary. Uh, importantly, don't lie to the border agents. There are a lot of countries, probably almost all, will have separate crimes for giving false information or lying to uh, governmental authorities, and that means that they'll have something uh, over you, even if there's nothing, uh, nothing else that they have for telling something that was untrue while talking to the border agent. Uh, don't physically interfere with the search. It's probably not going to work out. They have a lot of ability to stop physical interference, uh, unless perhaps you're uh, Jason Bourne. Uh, 
and uh, uh, your rights. One of the well, we'll talk about consent in a second. But if they seize your device physically from you, it's hard to say that you consented to give it to them. So you can help preserve your rights. Uh, and then if something does happen as it's going down, and you want to do something about it later, document it. Get names, badge numbers, agencies, get a receipt for the property. They'll give you the more power to do something about it later. Now, now I want to turn to the consent. First of all, there's something that often happens when uh, the border agents are talking to you. They'll phrase things in the form of a polite question. You know, would you like to give me your password? Can I see your device? Uh, and if you hand it over in response to that, they'll say, oh, it was consent. You have waived your rights. If you want to challenge it later, they'll say, well, you, you gave it up. Uh, so, uh, in some cases, you might want to clarify, well, is that an order? Am I required to do this? Or is that a request? And if they say it's a request, say, no, thank you. If they say it's an order, well, then you're going to get to choose your own adventure. Uh, you can choose to comply with the order, uh, and this will mean they'll have access to your device. Uh, you have more limited legal options later, be more about trying to get them to delete the data or remove it from their systems as opposed to not get it in the first place. Uh, but you'll probably be able to much more quickly go on your way, make your connecting flight, go to that conference that you were going to attend. Uh, or you can refuse to comply, stand up for your rights. Uh, and that can provide you greater legal options later because you can challenge their ability to do it. So, well, they can challenge their ability to get into your device by not providing the password until it has been adjudicated in a court of law. But this comes with consequences. This may escalate the situation. The device may be seized. You may have future trouble the next time you're going over a border. Uh, so these are difficult choices and will depend on your particular circumstance. And then after the border, again, document what has happened. Uh, in some, uh, if you're freedom of information laws in your jurisdiction, you might want to use those to get more information about what happened, see what public records could be provided. And another important uh, thing, if you did make that choice to hand over your password, change it. They will keep that password and it will be available to them for future border crossings and if it's a password to publicly available or you know, websites, they may use it to go on there. So change any passwords that they may have gotten access to as soon as you, get your, uh, as soon as you can. And with that, I'll turn it over to Bill to talk a little bit more about technical measures to protect yourself. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kurt. Um, yeah, so in addition to the legal protections that you have at the border, uh, there are some technical measures that you can take to protect yourself uh, in general. Uh, as Kurt said, that uh, the best thing is to not bring your device with you. If you don't have your device with you in the first place, then there's no data that they can get from it. In addition, you'll have the benefit of not being able to be contacted by your boss. Um, you can also use temporary devices, and that might also uh, provide some protection. You don't have legal measures. Um, uh, you don't have you don't have uh, uh, you know your apps that are installed in your device logged into uh, various accounts like Twitter um, or Facebook. Then they can't you know force your fingerprint onto that device and have your information immediately. Um, but you know, if you do choose to actually bring your device with you, then there are some things, some measures that you can take uh, if you do them right to protect the data that's on those devices. So just to kind of go into some of the capabilities, the technical capabilities that are, uh, uh, the border agents are, are able to get from your device. This is a slide from uh, a company's website called Celebrite. And Celebrite is a forensic analysis company. What they do is uh, they you know, basically create software for law enforcement to take Android devices and use the JTAG interface to image those devices and get data off of them. Uh, not only do they do this for law enforcement, but they say right on the website that they're operating in 100 countries across the world uh, and working with border patrols to do this. So we know that they're doing this at the border as well. And you can see the kind of different categories. This is an actual Celebrite uh, report that uh, they've generated from an image from a cell phone. And, uh, you know, you can, this is a categorized by calendar, call logs, these different things that they can get from your device after imaging it and, ana and analyzing it. Uh, it's important to kind of look at the right side of the column because uh, you can see that there are numerous 
categories that have deleted items. So not only can they get the files, the contacts, uh, events that uh, you have currently stored on your device, but they can also get those that you've deleted in the past. And we'll go over some protections against that as well. So the most powerful thing that you can do in general to protect your devices when crossing the border is employing full disk encryption. Um, it's an extremely powerful measure um, to you know, have your devices encrypted as you cross the border in general. And the important part is that this protects your data at rest. It does not protect your data when you're transferring it over you know, a website. Um, that's a different mechanism. So this is encrypting all the files on your device uh, when you're crossing the border, um, uh, all the, the, devi the device's files. Um, and you know, it's only as important as, uh, and only as, as, as secure as the, power, the passphrase that you choose to encrypt that device with. Um, in most cases, the screen unlock is a different passphrase from the, uh, from the uh, uh, full disk encryption passphrase. So you need to be aware of that. This is especially true with uh, desktop devices um, and not so much with mobile devices in general. Uh, so certain devices have this separate coprocessor that actually in, uh, increases the security that you have at, at boot time uh, when you're entering your disk encryption passphrase. Uh, one of the things that it can do is it can uh, uh, basically throttle the number of attempts that a third party can use when they're guessing, when they're actually trying to go through the guesses of your device passphrase. It can you know, lengthen the amount of time that it takes after each, sub each subsequent try. Uh, and, uh, and slow it down if you have numerous in, uh, incorrect uh, uh, attempts. And also it can lock the device after a certain number of tries. I think it's with iOS it's about 10 tries. Um, and uh, at, make it that device uh, you know, not actually capable of uh, unleasing the contents uh, and unlocking the device. Uh, this is due to a piece of uh, a coprocessor that's on uh, every iPhone since the 5S called the Secure Enclave. And what the Secure Enclave does is it takes that pin or passphrase that you have chosen and it entangles it uh, or mixes it with several different things that are stored in the Secure Enclave itself. Um, these are sources, uh, uh, this is key material that is stored in the UID, that's burned into the secure enclave at manufacture time, as well as a GID, which is uh, basically flashed and you can change, but you can't read the contact contents off of the secure enclave. Um, and that's where this kind of ex, uh, exfiltration resistance property comes from. So when you want to choose a good passphrase, uh, you really want to look for a strong uh, passphrase that, because these are critical for actually uh, securing the device in a proper way. Um, in modern situations with modern hardware, trillions and trillions of guesses can be tried in a very, very short period of time. Uh, they use huge word lists and complex combinatorics um, to make it so that they can brute force your passphrase and get at the contents. So what we recommend is using five or six random words in order to choose uh, your passphrase. This is pretty resilient against those brute force attacks. Um, and again, it can kind of be a very memorable passphrase too. If you have five or six different words, then you can create a story, weave a story about how that passphrase works. Um, a great example is XKCD's Correct Horse Battery Staple uh, comic that you probably are familiar with. In addition, you can kind of look at our website and get a good list of dice phrase passwords that you can use uh, and look into the methodology of how to generate these passphrases. So with device encryption, uh, there's mobile support uh, across the board for device encryption pretty much at this point. Uh, Android has uh, implemented uh, partial support since 2013. Uh, Android 6.0 uh, you know, implemented it uh, only if Google apps are enabled. So basically, since a, uh, uh, Android stock is an open source uh, uh, operating system, anyone can take it and implement it. But if you have Google apps installed on that device, there's a contractual obligation to to, uh, to actually implement uh, secure and uh, full disk encryption. 
and iOS has had it uh, for a long time, since ever since the iPhone 3GS um, and iPod Touches have it uh, with a third generation later. This is kind of look, what it looks like on different OEMs. On uh, the left, we have an Amazon uh, Fire HD 10, and on the right, we have a 5X device, and it, you can kind of see that there are different uh, UX uh, indicators that your phone has full disk encryption. And in general, in uh, desktop OS environments, uh, you can see that ever since 2013, this has been widely supported by Windows uh, and, uh, and Mac OS. And also, Linux has had it for a very long time um, in most distributions that's been available ever since the mid-2000s. So the important thing to know when you're using disk encryption is not to uh, forget your passphrase. Because if you forget your passphrase, in most cases, you actually aren't going to be able to access the data in general that's stored on that device. Um, some tools like BitLocker uh, on Windows will allow you to, uh, to kind of transfer your passphrase to uh, Windows and uh, to, to let Microsoft know uh, what it is. And you know, that means, of course, that if you're letting Microsoft know what it is, then they can unlock the contents of your laptop. So so um, you should, if you want to use this, keep in mind that uh, you have to be really comfortable with Microsoft being able to access all your data. Um, one thing that you can do is also turn off the fingerprint unlock, as Kurt mentioned. Uh, but you know, one thing that, that is probably more effective is actually turning your device off. And when you turn your device off and then bring it back up, uh, you, know, you can turn it off before you cross the border, bring it back up when you cross the border, and it'll prompt you again for your full disk encryption passphrase, and it'll bypass the, uh, the, you know, the screen unlock that's in your fingerprint. Uh, this also means that it's going to prevent, uh, you know, DMA attacks, um, direct memory access attacks, or zero days on, you know, screen unlock uh, programs. Um, but of course, this really only works if you have a uh, password set um, at all. Uh, and you might remember this. So moving on from uh, full disk encryption passphrases and, and, uh, and disk encryption, there's also a mechanism called trusted boot. And it's a way to ensure that the boot process in general is verified and trusted by the operating system. So it uh, you know, goes all the way from you know, the pre-boot sequence to the operating system loading, loading itself. And this requires some kind of a hardware trusted platform module or equivalent piece of hardware um, that's built into the device uh, that's separate from the CPU. And this uh, you know, verifies the boot sequence all the way to the OS. Um, and it can kind of provide this neat thing called remote attestation that lets you know as a user that the boot process has been secured. Uh, one of the most clever implementations of trusted boot um, was, uh, was demonstrated by Tremel Hudson uh, last year at CCC, and it uses this thing called uh, Trusted Platform Module uh, Time-Based One-Time Password. And what this does, and this is an example of it, um, you have the uh, seed for the one time, the TOTP that's actually encoded in the TPM, and then it attests the boot process, generates a one-time password, which you can verify with an Android app like Google Authenticator. I thought that was a really cool implementation. There's mobile support for trusted boot as well. Um, there's iOS's low-level bootloader, which, uh, which bootstraps iBoot, which boots into the operating system itself. Uh, and Android 4.4 and later, uh, it's called Verified Boot, and it uses the trusted execution environment and Android devices in some cases where they're available. So you can check if your device has this and, uh, and is equivalent uh, to Trusted Boot. Uh, one thing to keep in mind about that, though, is that uh, software support uh, for Trusted Boot is only available in two uh, different Android operating systems. One is stock Android, and two is Copperhead OS, um, which has a very high level of security. If you're using something like Lineage OS, you won't get the benefits of Trusted Boot. Uh, and on the right here, we have kind of a, a graph which shows uh, what the boot process looks like uh, in these various different uh, configurations and if you've loaded a third-party ROM. 
So, you know, in Trusted Boot desktop support, for Windows 8 has this thing called Secure Boot. What's keep, important to keep in mind about Secure Boot is that, well, it's an e, a UEFI standard um, that Windows uses, and it's not Trusted Boot. Uh, it doesn't secure against uh, local attackers. Trusted Boot does. Uh, Windows 8 and the Secure Boot mechanism really doesn't, and it's not intended to. Um, it's good against remote attacks, but it's not, you know, going to protect you much if you're at the border. Uh, Linux supports various different uh, distros that have uh, trusted boot in, uh, uh, available for them. You can use self-signed keys uh, in many cases, but you should check on your hardware support if it's available for you. Chrome OS has had this built in since the beginning, and the, it's in, in the form of a, it's called verified boot, just like it's available in uh, Android. Uh, verified boot has gotten better over time against local attacks. And Mac OS has Secure Boot available uh, on an iMac Pro, um, but if you're at the border, uh, iMacs uh, aren't really used uh, for travel very much, uh, unless you're very audacious. Uh, so secure deletion, um, you can kind of see the secure deletion method that uh, Elliot on Mr. Robot uses by microwaving his hard drives. Um, but if you're not as enterprising as Elliot and you might want to bring those devices over the border, then you can use secure deletion. Uh, uh, and what's important here is that secure deletion you know, is, is very different from simple deletion. If you simply delete a file on your hard drive, then that's not going to do much. It just changes, it just erases the lines around it saying this is a file. All the data in those files are actually still there. So, you know, border agents have these uh, complicated forensic tools, and even simple tools can get those files back. But border agents uh, have things like Celebrite, as I mentioned before, and they can recover these deleted files, emails, contacts, etc. cetera. Uh, and so secure deletion should really be used if you want to remove those files, um, and there are various tools uh, that you can use to do it. But there are also some caveats. Uh, and, you know, when we're talking about secure deletion, you think about you know, things like factory reset or formatting. Factory reset, it depends. It may or may not actually remove the data securely from your device. Um, it depends on your OS, and it depends on if you have full disk encryption enabled in the first place. Uh, so that's important to keep in mind. Factory reset, um, often doesn't cover things, like if you have, for instance, a uh, SSD that's entered into your phone and you do a factory reset, it's not going to oftentimes delete the data in that phone. So that's kind of something that you should keep in mind. Uh, secure deletion is quite easy on laptops, but sometimes it's hard to find tools that work well on mobile platforms or tablets. Uh, in addition, uh, when you're talking about USB flash drives, uh, SSDs, memory cards, and the like, uh, they implement something called wear leveling, which means that when you're doing writes and reads to those cards, uh, they kind of spread them across the solid state, uh, and that means that the OS has no way to introspect to learn about where on the SSD those bytes are being actually stored. So they can't, you can't use programs that do secure deletion on these. So that's kind of something that you, know, you can't reliably do uh, for SSDs, memory cards, and the like. Um, you know, when we're talking about formatting, uh, there's two definitions of formatting, two different things that we're talking about. Um, there's something called a high-level format, which definitely does not delete the data that you want to securely delete. And then there's low-level formatting, which by and large will delete the data that we really want to, to get rid of. Uh, and some of the tools in secure deletion, um, there's, there's a distinction between the individual files that you might want to delete, and then there's free space that you want to delete. Uh, Linux has tools like Scrub, and Scrub is good with uh, the dash X argument if you want to delete all, and override all the free space uh, with, with zeros, zero out that free space. Um, and it can also use, be used for individual files. Wipe is another tool, um, but both Linux and Windows have a utility called BleachBit, um, which we can delete uh, not only individual files, but also things that you might not even think about, like uh, browser history, thumbnails, uh, cache uh, of, of you know, different programs that you have installed. Um, so this is, this is kind of a good way to get down to the things that you might forget about. Um, but again, it might be imperfect too, so you should look into how uh, well it works. 
And uh, finally, for mobile devices, I think that the, the best thing is to actually use disk encryption. Um, and this can be used as a kind of way to do secure deletion. So if you have your full disk encrypted, then you actually, you know, make it unreadable unless you have, you know, for instance, that passphrase. Um, often the way that disk encryption works is that you use a passphrase um, to unlock a short uh, AES key in the beginning of uh, a partition and then like go and it actually uses that then to decrypt the entire drive. Um, but if you use, uh, if you wipe that decryption key in the beginning of the drive, then uh, this will make the data fully unavailable. Um, so that's one way to actually make sure that your files are securely deleted. Uh, this is kind of built into the, what's called factory reset in iOS and also power wash on Chromebooks. In Linux, uh, this can be achieved by formatting your hard drive and uh, just reinstalling it from uh, you know, uh, another copy of it. Uh, and finally, cl cloud storage. Cloud storage is a good way to basically move those vital files off of the device that you want um, to be somewhere else. And often is the case that if you upload it to the cloud and you have less legal protections than having it on your device. But when you're crossing the border, this actually might be the reverse. You might have better protections when you're crossing the border uh, if you have your, your contents of various files on the cloud instead. So this is kind of a process of data minimization organization um, and, uh, and you know you can kind of hide those files from snooping border guards uh, and also kind of uh, makes it better for theft when traveling abroad. But of course there is no cloud, there is just other people's computers. Uh, and in cloud storage, you have risks. You have the risk of a government coming and issuing a subpoena to a third party, to, to your cloud provider, and it's them saying, fork over the data, and that can be uh, very dangerous. That can actually get you, your data to the government. Hackers don't need a subpoena. They can just hack into the cloud servers and get that data themselves. Uh, and also, um, for unfortunate fact is that most cloud providers only offer encryption when uploading it in transit to, you know, uh, something like Dropbox, and it's just sitting there for all to see uh, in the in the server side when you have it actually on Dropbox itself. So, you know, there are uh, some services that offer client-side encryption where you encrypt the files on your local device before ever sending it up to the cloud. And uh, this is often called zero knowledge in the industry. It's kind of a weird terminology because it's different from uh, zero knowledge proof that you might know from cryptography. Um, it provides protection against, again, governments and hackers, um, but you should really remember to back up and remember your key material and passphrase if you're using this method. So here's a kind of chart of the different services that offer uh, client-side encryption and do not offer it. You'll notice that the most popular services uh, don't actually offer client-side encryption and you have to use uh, some of the lesser known services in order to, to really get the best protection uh, uh, for your cloud backups. And finally, you can use a self-hosted service like OwnCloud or NextCloud um, if you're not trusting cloud services in general and just want to host your own uh, way to back up your, your files. And this comes with some you know, uh, advantages and disadvantages. Uh, one advantage is that I call it subpoena resilience, which means that you will have the subpoena come to you directly, so you'll actually know about it, whereas your cloud service provider might actually never tell you. Um, and the other thing is that with uh, OwnCloud and NextCloud, they have a uh, service that allows you to use client-side encryption. Uh, as of NextCloud 11, which is coming out in some point next year, they're going to offer client-side encryption as a default. So that's a kind of great uh, way to uh, you know, protect your data by yourself in a way that you control. Uh, but one, you know, kind of really important consideration to keep in mind is that you want HTTPS enabled on your server when you're using these cloud services uh, if you're self-hosting. So some of the takeaways from this uh, is that, you know, best defense is not to bring your device with you. Um, you know, you might kind of be a little bit less stressed out if you just don't have that device with you in the first place. Um, secondly, if you do choose to, you know, bring your device with you, use full disk encryption, use a trusted boot, uh, you know, a, a computer that, that enables trusted boot has it built in, um, and you, you know, employ some data minimization practices um, that can offer some powerful full protections uh, for your data in general. Uh, so with that, thanks very much, and I think we're going to turn it over to questions. 
All right, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Well, thank you very much. That was great advice. Okay, we'll have a short Q&A. We have about eight minutes. So, um, people queuing up on the mics. Here, here you are. Sorry, excuse me. So, first one, number three, please. One sentence with a question mark at the end, right? <laughs> about devices being bugged at the border, so spy programs putting on it. Yeah, so if you have some kind of a trusted boot mechanism, then they, if they can't get into the operating system level, then you know some spyware that is installed the operating system level, they can't actually get to in the first place. So that's a good protection. Okay, hang on. There's a question from the internet. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you. Do you think it's a good idea to have um, a dummy account or a dummy profile on a device? One of the challenges with having a, a dummy account or dummy profile is that uh, in the context of discussing it, uh, you may be put in a position where you would be giving false information to the uh, border agent, and then if it was discovered that there was a different account, uh, then you would have uh, potentially opened yourself up to a penalty for giving that false information that then could be used to give tremendous pressure upon you to access the uh, rest of the device as you might be facing some uh, 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 jail time. Okay, let's try the mic on the left side, please. You said, Could you? Do, not, you said do not lie to border agents. Um, what, if, what about claiming I just forgot your, my password? And what about saying it's 200 characters on a random sheet of paper under my bed? Well, one of the things we do would be to actually not know your password, right? So if you, uh, as I'm, I still stand by, don't lie to the border agents, but uh, you, if you actually don't know your password, then you can truthfully say that. And then uh, perhaps when you get to the far side, uh, you could have some other mechanism of getting that 200 character password to you so you could unlock your device. Uh, so that may enable you to be truthful about it and not be able to give up the information. Uh, keep in mind that if you're in a situation where if they don't like your answers, they can uh, refuse to have you come into the country, they may do so even though you say you don't, you don't have, uh, uh, they may not care why you can't give it into them, but be dissatisfied enough to turn you away. Okay, thank you over here, please. Um, uh, on the SSD uh, um, erasing, I just wanted to comment that uh, if you delete your files and then write a random file over the whole disk, you will get most of the solid state data covered and replaced. But my actual question is, do you know if there are already forensic tools that can retrieve the data that's stored after I've uh, trimmed my data and it's still on the solid state side on the SSD drive, can I read that out? By trim, do you mean securely delete? No, no, I mean, uh, when I delete my files, the trim system will just tell the SSD that these blocks are not used anymore, but they are still uh, set on the solid state side. So, do you know if forensic tools can actually ask the SSD hey, tell me what's hidden there that you marked deleted, but what you still have programmed in so that I can retrieve the data. Uh, not, if that wouldn't be available, then I wouldn't have to do the extra erase that I just, uh, the extra overwrite that I just suggested. Yeah, um, so I'm not aware of any tools like that. One thing to know about SSDs is that they have embedded firmware in them themselves. So uh, you can conceivably see an SSD card that actually kind of exfiltrates uh, uh, any data that you write to it to some kind of hidden uh, extra partition. I think a Bunny Huang uh, actually has done a, re a lot of research on that. So if you want to look into that, that, that's a good place to start. Okay, thank you. Another question from the internet. Thank you. First, a brief comment. Um, VeraCrypt has been missed on your list um, of encryption tools. And then the question, do you know a zero-knowledge cloud client for a common cloud provider? Maybe even open source so that we can see that it actually encrypts? So uh, for the common uh, cloud provider that uses client-side encryption, um, 
you know, there are the main ones that you might have heard of, that you know your whole family might have heard about. Um, don't really offer it in general, um, but uh, if you have a semaphore um, and, uh, or uh, you know if you use Spider Oaks um, programs, and they are kind of a well vetted uh, system for for doing client side encryption uh, backed up backups on the cloud. Okay, thank you. One more question on the left side here. Uh, so my question is uh, less technical, maybe more legal. I was wondering uh, regarding being careful about consent and kind of choosing your own adventure. Is there a distinction, any meaningful distinction between complying with a search and consenting? Can you say, you know, I understand that you're ordering me to, you know, submit a password, submit a phone. Um, I'm going to comply with that under, you know, under duress, not not consenting to keep your legal options available in the future. Yeah, I, mean, I think there, there, there uh, are important distinctions, and I think, in, in the truth is, uh, even if somebody uh, uh, gives what appears to be consent under those circumstances, there's actually some pretty good arguments that that's not a freely given consent. You're under tremendous pressure, you're being uh, kept away from uh, other forms of communications, uh, it is a situation in which the uh, custom agents have tremendous power over you, uh, and so I think that, that even if you, if, if you said, uh, you know, uh, I'm not not consenting, but here you go. Uh, I, I, you could certainly argue that that wasn't consent, and I think there are all circumstances and we're like, fine. You know, you could say that you weren't really consenting to that, but the cl more clearly you say that, that you're not consenting, uh, or the more clearly you, you clarify whether it is a request or an order, that could help uh, your situation later, especially if you were able to clarify that it is just a request and thereby uh, say no. We'll take one final question, just before all the frustration breaks out. Kurt and William said <clears throat> they'll be at the EFF stand, which is in level plus one on the CCL. So if you people have questions, go and ask. They will take, sorry, one final question on the right side. Uh, yes, adding on top of the uh, dummy account question, I'd like to ask if you can recommend a program that automatically does switch these accounts based on which password I enter into my device. Yeah, so a plausible deniability uh, kind of schema. Um, I believe that there are those schemas out there, um, but I think Kurt probably has an opinion about whether you should use them or not. Uh, I mean, I, I, it's the same, same issue as, as before. You, you're, you're taking a risk by trying to do that, and that is the risk that if that is discovered, that is really suspicious to them. And so that, that highly escalates the matter. So you're, you're trading off the, this uh, possibility that you'll be able to appear to be uh, cooperative uh, and uh, not have them access to the, the true information against the, the possibility that uh, they discover that something uh, uh, funny is going on, you know, after they put it through the cell bright or, or, or whatnot and see there's a lot of uh, data that they're not able to access uh, and then the consequences uh, r ratchet up. So uh, I think that it's, it's a relatively uh, high risk if something goes wrong that you will be treated as a very suspicious person. I know that there is a, uh, another piece of software um, that Backtrack uh, uses that if you enter a certain pass, like Lux passphrase, then it'll instead delete the contents of your device. Um, again, I'm if not recommending that you did that at the border, they would that, find that extremely <laughs> suspicious. <laughs> Just saying it's out there. Okay, thank you. I'm afraid we'll have to close this now. Let's give a final big hand for Kurt Oblau and William Banning. Thank you, thank you everybody.